Good evening, and boy, what a lovely evening it is. This is another night when I'm really wishing I had my whole microphone headset worked out so I could be sitting out on the porch here at Good Natured World Headquarters instead of up here in the office where the thermostat says 83 degrees up here on the second floor. Um, I opened a window, um, so hopefully the outside noise won't make its way in and hopefully the outside breeze will make its way in uh, as we go through tonight's program. All kinds of things have been happening. I've, I've been doing my best uh, to document it with uh, photos or videos. Um, and you guys have come through too. We've got some, some nice contributions from the good natured crowd. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started with tonight's program. Started from the beginning, hopefully. So, <laughs> fair warning uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be on kind of a crayfish kick. We're going to talk about crayfish again next week, a little spoiler alert, and uh, even the week following with uh, some of the things that eat crayfish. But um, this is such a neat phenomenon. If you happen to find yourself by a, a creek, if you can find a creek with water in it, that's probably the first challenge. Um, we are still so very, very dry, but um, we are still seeing uh, crayfish walking around with this particular condition um, known as, uh, uh, well, they're dangerous, which, which means they're carrying eggs, which um, is often referred to as being in berry. Uh, and this was a, a photo that I'd actually taken a couple of years ago because I couldn't get a good photo of the crayfish I found a couple of weeks ago. But um, this shows you just um, what it takes to be a mama crayfish. Um, all of those little, um, little uh, globes underneath the tail, those are all uh, crayfish eggs. Let's zoom in on that a little bit so you can see um, just what we're talking about here. These are the uh, developing embryos inside of a uh, uh, kind of a translucent uh, egg case. Um, or encased egg, I should say, uh, that the female uh, fixes to her belly. She secretes a substance that's kind of sticky, uh, gooey, almost uh, kind of mucusy, like actually. Uh, and as she then produces these eggs, they adhere underneath her tail, which when you're a baby crayfish, that is about the best place you can hope to be uh, because you've got a uh, mama that's walking around with two uh, large pinchers that she uses to defend herself and she's going to use them to defend you as well. Um, this is what happens when those eggs hatch. Uh, the, the babies immediately, they, they take advantage of the protection that, that mom is going to offer um, and they continue to cling on for uh, a couple of molts over a couple of weeks time. Um, they uh, will be uh, starting to uh, feed a little bit, um, they're clinging. You can kind of see here, uh, crayfish have these structures called swimmerets, which we'll get back to actually in a couple of slides. But um, once that, that glare substance yeah, kind of wears away, once the eggs have hatched, then the babies uh, are holding on as they move, as mom moves around. Um, and uh, here's one that may have dropped off. I don't know, it looked, seemed awfully small to be out on its own. Um, and if it, maybe it dropped off on purpose, maybe this was its first day off on its own. I don't know, but that was kind of a, kind of a fun thing to see. Um, this is another photo. This is one of our uh, terrestrial species. I believe this is a prairie crayfish. Um, uh, this is one of those uh, species that would uh, dig a, a burrow and create a chimney like you'll often see. Uh, in our uh, wet areas or in lawns that have wet areas nearby. Um, again, these are eggs after they've hatched, but before the young are able to uh, make it on their own. They're hanging on uh, for dear life there with mom for just a few more days before they drop off and um, uh, live independent of her. So kind of a, a touching 
little glimpse into the uh, the maternal side of what we wouldn't really consider to be um, a, a very uh, warm and cuddly sort of an animal, but they do nonetheless provide this protection. We're going to look at an, a couple other um, interesting cases of uh, maternalism uh, later on in the program, but um, I wanted to delve just a little bit farther into um, crayfish reproduction. This is a really neat party trick, um, as long as you're party is being held uh, creekside and you've got a net and you happen to catch a few crayfish, um, you can actually pretty easily tell the males from the females. Um, now this picture shows uh, a male in his reproductive or form one mode, but remember those swimmerettes that I mentioned? Uh, they're also called pleopods. And um, in the female, they're all fairly uniform, but you'll notice in the male, the first two pairs are, are uh, they have a different shape to them. They're somewhat enlarged. And this is very obvious, uh, regardless of whether the male is in a reproductive mode or not. Um, so if, if you see uh, structures that are slightly enlarged uh, towards the um, area where the, uh, the abdomen or the tail meets the, uh, the um, thorax part of the animal, then you know you're looking at a male. If those parts are absent and you see a little opening, then you know you're looking at a female. Couldn't be easier, right? Um, well, there is just a little bit more of the story. This is a, a somewhat famous chart. It's in all the crayfish books and it follows um, the, the uh, reproductive life of the male. Um, as it turns out, male crayfish go through a couple of different um, phases or forms. And um, starting off in the middle is, um, you can see this, this, this blue area indicates um, neither uh, form one nor form two. This is, uh, would be the immature phase of the crayfish. But then um, they go into this, uh, what they would call uh, form, uh, form one, and that is where the male's reproductive structures change a little bit in size and shape, and he becomes, um, well, he starts looking for a girl. He starts looking for a girlfriend. So um, that lasts for uh, about three months or so, and then um, uh, he changes back into a non-reproductive form um, right here, and then he changes into a reproductive form again, which you'll notice is um, quite a bit of time. Uh, they, they spend much more time reproducing than not reproducing. Um, and uh, things quiet down again. And then the spiral just continues on and on for the span lifespan of the crayfish, which um, I would say is anywhere from say, you know, three to five or six years. There was one reference I read where they said they lived 20 to 30 years. Um, I don't know if that was a typo or a misprint or if there's really some, some decades old crayfish out there. Um, but um, I would say, you know, given all the things that eat them, uh, that's going to drive down the average lifespan. Maybe, you know, if they're lucky, they can hang around for a long time. But anyway, the male is gonna cycle through these uh, form one and form two uh, parts of his life. Um, and here's uh, some views of those pleopods in the reproductively active stage, that form one part, which is most of the year, um, there's going to be some very distinct um, uh, shapes to uh, his gonopods. They're um, gonna be uh, sort of um, pointy, <laughs> I guess would be a good way to describe them. There's very distinct sculptures on the end and in fact, uh, in some crayfish species, you actually have to look at those and you have to have the male in the form one uh, stage in order to be able to uh, accurately identify what you're looking at. Um, but then when, when um, he goes into form two, when he's not chasing after the ladies, uh, these structures, you can see they get uh, more, uh, they're blunter, uh, they get sort of a orangish, uh, sometimes reddish cast to them. Uh, they've become very hard in nature. These are a little bit more pliable. Um, they're still stiff, but um, they are uh, not as, um, as blunt and, and dense as they are when they are um, 
basically not being used. So form one and form two um, parts of the male crayfish reproductive cycle. That's really, really important when you get into some of the nitty gritty of uh, crayfish identification. Um, but uh, regardless of whether um, they're uh, reproducing or not, um, we've got some, some really magnificent types uh, in this uh, area. I'm actually going to hold off till next week. We're going to do some, some more crayfish identification next week. But I just got this photo in this afternoon uh, uh, from you, Chris. Um, I love the, the note that went with it. Um, this, was, uh, this crayfish was found out at Nelson Lake uh, last weekend. And it was at least the size of a size 11 foot. Now that is one big crayfish. If there's ever a case for a crayfish that might be uh, able to live 20 or 30 years, it might be this one here. This is, um, I know it looks quite red, but it is not the Louisiana reds or the swamp reds that have been introduced into this area. That is actually uh, one of our native species known as the White River, or uh, the, the species name is Acutus uh, crayfish. Um, and they, they like slower moving waters like you would find out at Nelson Lake Marsh. And we also see these up at Otter Creek Bend. Uh, they've got uh, real narrow uh, pinchers on the, the end of that first set of legs. Um, it's a neat species. This is a monster though. Uh, I kind of feel like I should go out and look for this, uh, see what kind of stories it can teach. But anyway, um, we will continue our look at crayfish uh, during the Good Natured Hour next week, but I really appreciate uh, this photo, uh, Mr. Occasionally Good Natured Guy. It uh, really uh, added something. Maybe it'll inspire you guys to go out and, and see what kind of crayfish you can find on your own. So um, the other part of the crayfish story is the things that eat crayfish. They are so, um, this. The crayfish is such an important part of our local food chains. These are a few of our local birds that might be found munching on crayfish, the herons, the egrets, barred owls, because they tend to hang out where it's wet. Uh, crayfish uh, sometimes play a, a pretty pivotal role in their um, ecology. We've got a lot of mammals that eat crayfish too. Uh, raccoons and mink are probably uh, two of the, the uh, top predators in this area. Um, but you know, if, if crayfish were to, for whatever reason, disappear, uh, our uh, local food web would would really be in trouble. They, these animals, it's a good thing that uh, mama crayfish are walking around with anywhere from 30 to maybe several hundred eggs glued under their tail because they are so very important to all of these other different animals. Now, uh, with that. We're going to look at another uh, endearing mom story. Uh, I know Mother's Day is past, Father's Day is just around the corner, but uh, this young lady showed up at our native plant sale uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was cleaning up afterwards and I was moving some uh, trays around, you know, the, uh, the trays, the growing trays that the plants had come in. And I was about to stack um, another tray on top of this one. And I noticed that amongst the debris in the bottom of the tray, there was this white object that I at first thought was a little bit of perlite you know, from some of the growing medium. Uh, but then I looked again and I saw that the white blob was attached to this dark blob. Um, this is um, a wolf spider uh, carrying her egg sac behind her. Now, um, I think we've talked before about how spiders spin different types of silk for different uh, purposes. Wolf spiders, um, they, they might lay a little uh, drag line behind them uh, as they're out foraging. Um, they, it helps them find their way back lair. It also can help them um, uh, sense if there's prey in the area, if, if uh, an insect or uh, other little possible food item trips over a bit of silk that can help um, let them know what's in the area. But they really are primarily uh, sight hunters and, and ambush hunters. So they're not going to be spinning big webs to catch prey in, but they will be spinning a really tough silk and then a real sticky silk. That tough silk will encase the eggs and the sticky silk will help um, attach it to on the tip of her abdomen. And she will tote this around with her as she goes about her business uh, feeding herself. 
Uh, now we do have some other spiders in the area, our fishing spiders, they actually carry their egg sac uh, in their mouths. So uh, they're not able to feed while they are nurturing their uh, soon to be offspring. But um, not only do the, the wolf spiders uh, carry the egg sac around like this, but uh, once it hatches, just like with the crayfish, uh, after they come out of their eggs, they hang on to mom's tail for a while. This isn't the greatest picture, so you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, I took it. Uh, I'm just not that great of a photographer, but this was a, a wolf spider I saw last year. Uh, this was taken in July. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a timeline of when these different um, things happen. Um, right now, the, the wolf spiders, for the most part, maybe there's some that uh, the eggs have already hatched, but uh, look for these in the future. I was talking to someone recently who said that. Uh, one time they were working, they were at work, they worked in a retail store, they saw what they thought was the biggest spider in the world, right before the store was about to open and they went to, uh, I think, squish it. <laughs> they didn't want to tell me that part, but um, when they when they touched it, all these babies just kind of sprung off and, and uh, ran away and um, it actually caused quite a bit of squealing before, right before the store was going to open. So keep that in mind. If you see a mama wolf spider and she's got all these spiderlings, uh, spiderlings on her back, um, best to just leave her be because um, you could end up with way more spiders to deal with than um, you really wanted to. Uh, again, this is uh, happening right now and will continue through this next um, month or so in the summertime. Now we're gonna stay with the spider theme for a little bit longer. I got this email last week. Um, says, I discovered a spider on my wall in my office this morning and successfully ushered him outside. Do you have any idea of what kind it is? His appendages are plumper than any in my insect book. And I looked up Illinois spiders and I didn't find anything that looked like him. It's much larger than the most of the house spiders. I was glad I could capture it and release it into the wild. Let's see what this spider is. So um, this is actually, this is a, a bold jumping spider. Let's take a look. Um, Linda, who sent this, did a nice job of, of capturing um, jumping spider um, in all of its glory. Now, you'll notice I said this is a male. Um, couple things give us that um, impression here. The abdomen is fairly small. Um, by and large, male spiders are going to be just a little bit leaner and rangier looking than the rangier with an R, not mangier with an M, rangier than the uh, the females. And um, because that's their job is they, they, they walk around looking for the ladies. Uh, they don't tend to have uh, much in the way of the real elaborate lab webs that we're gonna start seeing uh, very soon um, in all of our downtown, river downtowns, uh, on the bridges, on the uh, store windows, um, all different places where the river bugs be, we're going to have spiders that are gonna be taking advantage of that. Those are the females. They need to catch as much protein as they can because they're gonna be uh, making those eggs um, as we get farther along into summer and early fall. But the other thing, let's play this video. Let me stop it here. See, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight legs. And then here's the two pedipalps up here at the front. And they're just uh, ever so slightly enlarged on the ends. Those are his reproductive organs. And um, I, I think in the past, I've referred to them as they look kind of like little boxing gloves. That is the surest way, the easiest way to tell male uh, spiders from uh, the females. So, yeah, thankfully this guy um, landed in the home of a, uh, a I wouldn't call her a spider lover, but she cared enough to not squish it. And she did go ahead and put it outside. Now, meanwhile, um, there, uh, I've been seeing the bold jumping spiders uh, in a lot of different places. Um, they have a lot of variation. Let's go back to our male here for a minute. See how he's got just a little bit of marking here on his abdomen. The, the bold jumping spider, um, it's probably our biggest jumping spider in the area. Jumpers um, are, they, they look real fuzzy. Uh, in fact, when we look at this uh, picture, which you can tell I did not take, um, 
they've got these large, these two are, are, are they are also uh, sight hunters and um, they've got two very large eyes in the front, which um, kind of give them, I say this a lot, uh, a teddy bear look to them. But then they've also got here on the uh, chelicery, the, uh, where the fangs are, just above there, there's this iridescent green color, which is another tip off. So uh, if you see a, a large hairy spider, um, I know we'll get calls at the nature center, but it's big and it's hairy. It's gotta be you know, deadly poisonous. It's, it's not, it's, it does have venom. All spiders have venom. Um, it's not considered medically significant. Uh, and this is, um, we're having a, a great season for them because it's been um, hot and humid and um, it's a good season for bugs. So it's a good season for spiders. Uh, now, this is gonna correlate to uh, some late breaking news. I got this text a little while ago from you, Laura uh, McKinsey, which uh, you, I think we're forwarding a text from um, uh, your sister, Jerry, who said, I've got mutual of Omaha wild kingdom, a bug situation here in the backyard. I put chicken wire around my potted dill to protect the four black swallowtail caterpillars on it from the marauding birds. But a couple of minutes ago, I went out to check on them and I could only see four. I looked down and I found this. So here we've got uh, a very bold jumper. And I, I almost wonder, Jerry, if something else happened to this caterpillar. Um, and that seems like a, a really large um, prey item for a spider like this. But you know, who knows? Uh, it could be a really, really hungry uh, jumping spider. But anyway, um, this and the, notice the the bulging abdomen on this particular jumper. This this is clearly a, a female, um, and yeah, she's going to be eating like a queen tonight. Uh, sorry about by the way the loss of your caterpillar, and I'm glad you've still got some other ones there that will be enjoying um, your dill. Um, I did also want to point out you probably saw this, Jerry, um, but those of you who I have gardens, whether you've got uh, dill or um, fennel or carrots, anything in that parsley family, even if you've got like Queen Anne's lace in your neighborhood, it's always kind of fun to look and see if you can find uh, some black swallowtail caterpillars they feed. That, those are the plants, that's the plant family that they feed on. But look how different the earlier instars look. They don't look at all. Uh, let's go back here to the, the boldly marked and the, um, large, I would say, you know, the size of your pinky finger or better. Um, that's the uh, black swallowtail shortly before it goes uh, into pupation. This is what it looks like earlier on. Um, very, very different. Um, but uh, again, the food plant is uh, one of the giveaways. So keep your eyes open for these. Uh, they'll be um, uh, occurring on uh, plants in the parsley family uh, throughout the summertime. Now, this is something, uh, if you do happen to have some um, uh, later instar black swallowtail caterpillars, this is something I always like to do. And I, again, I'm not a great photographer. I tried to, to show what's going on here, but uh, if you give the caterpillar a little squeeze up near the head, uh, you'll see these, this little V-shaped structure come out. It, it always reminds me of Uncle Martin from that old TV show, My Favorite Martian. Remember how the antennae would come up out of his head, you know, go back down. Well, this is, um, this is actually a, a defense mechanism that the black swallowtail caterpillar has. That's called um, the, uh, the osmeteria. And um, it actually releases a, a smell that is supposed to deter, deter predators. The combination of that surprise um, orange thing uh, squirting up um, or shooting up, it doesn't squirt anyway, it stays attached. Um, and then the essence that it releases are supposed to uh, deter predators. And it, it must do a pretty good job on most things. Um, maybe not bold jumping spiders, but it's kind of fun. I, I don't believe it's harmful. You probably wouldn't want to do it over and over again, but if you do find a black swallowtail caterpillar, see if you can find the osmentarium too. It's uh, another fun thing to do in the summer. 
So um, while we're going down the, the road of, of things that are appearing now, things that are catching people's eyes, um, the Tanucha moths are flying right now. This is um, a moth species in this area that um, it, it actually um, has several host plants for its caterpillars. It's somewhat unique though, in that it is a daytime flying moth. Um, they're really cool looking. Uh, if we take a look here, it's got this iridescence here on the uh, thorax. It's got a bright orange uh, head. It's got the feathery antennae. Uh, in fact, I believe this is a male, judging by the uh, some with some caterpillar. Or I'm sorry, some moth species. Uh, you look at those antennae, um, and if they're they're big and feathery, they're uh, males. And if they're slender and not so feathery, they're the females. Um, these moths have somewhat slender antennae to start with. So for a tanucha moth, that looks pretty feathery. So we're gonna go with uh, that being a male. It had uh, lit on, um, what did it light on there? Is that a dogwood? Uh, anyway, it was out um, fluttering around the other day. Since then, I have seen several of these. We had our um, KCCN, our Kane County Certified Naturalist field trip last Saturday out at uh, Dick Young uh, Forest Preserve, Nelson Lake Marsh. And uh, these guys were all over in the prairie area too. So even though um, a lot of times we consider moths more woodland creatures, um, this is a, a great example of a very broad, a generalist moth that can be found in a lot of different places. Uh, and it flies in the daytime. Um, now, you might also be seeing caterpillars that look like this. This is the Tanucha moth uh, caterpillar. It's fuzzy. Uh, you can find these uh, most months out of the year, and with the number of Tanucha moths that we're seeing, we're probably going to be seeing quite a few of these moths, too. The uh, color pattern can be kind of variable, but the, the skin underneath is white. Um, it's got this reddish head and you'll notice it's fuzzy. They will overwinter in the caterpillar stage. Um, and you can, yeah, you can find caterpillars um, many different times throughout the warm weather months. This is a moth that would have two broods in this area. Um, so uh, you might be lucky enough to find the adult and you might then later find the uh, the caterpillar too. This is this was one of those things where it, it took me a while to put these pieces together. This. The, uh, the moth picture is from just the other day. The caterpillar picture is from uh, last summer, but it was after, we, we also had a lot of tanucha moths last summer too. So it's kind of, it's always kind of fun when you can put two different um, life stages uh, together, even though they look very, very different. Now, um, also during the KCCN field trip, um, you know, out in the, the prairie, the, most of our, our singing insects are orthopterans, which are our uh, crickets, our katydids, and our grasshoppers. They're not quite mature enough to be singing yet, but throughout the day, um, during the field trip, we were serenaded by uh, field crickets. So it's kind of the, the quintessential cricket sound. Um, as it turns out, um, we've got both spring field crickets and fall field crickets. They look identical and they sound identical, but one comes out in the spring and one comes out in the fall. Uh, the party trick with these guys, um, what you're looking at here is a female and you can tell that by this very, very long ovipositor. No, it's not a stinger. No, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, the males lack that egg laying organ, but um, that's the sound that they make, that, that um, uh, stridulation that they do is, is performed uh, by moving the wings. Now that's the males that are making the sound, the females are the listeners, um, but the males accomplish that by rubbing one wing against the other. It's kind of a, um, a file and rasp type arrangement on the surfaces of the wings and they rub them back and forth and they make that sound. So that's um, uh, one party trick is to identify the males and the females. The other thing you can do is you can use the cricket as a thermometer. Uh, Dolbear's law, um, 
which was published in an article in 1897, gives a sort of a complicated uh, equation. Um, and it was assumed that he was talking about the field cricket, but then um, other people got involved and they found that the snowy tree cricket is probably the most uh, accurate, um, but it's also a little bit more complicated, complicated formula uh, in terms of telling the temperature using um, the number of chirps. But um, you can also just take that formulation for the field cricket, which again, they're chirping right now. Um, and you can um, take the number of chirps that you hear in either 15 or 14 seconds. I was seeing references to both. You count the number of chirps that you hear and then you add 40 and that will give you your temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, Amos Dober um, gave us this uh, pretty neat formula in 1897. But um, turns out there was a, a woman back um, yeah, 16 years prior in 1881, Margaret W. Brooks uh, published an article in uh, a journal that was called Popular Science Monthly. Um, you, can, you can look this up online, volume 20. Uh, which covers November 1881 to April 1882. This was kind of a letter to the editor that she wrote where she um, detailed her observations and, and pretty much gave old Amos Delbert everything he needed to come up with his law. But uh, this was, um, you know, one, it was, it was written by a, a woman at a time when a lot of uh, attention was not being paid to women and scientific discoveries. And it wasn't published uh, as a peer reviewed article. It was just kind of a, a letter um, that she mailed in saying, you know, here, here's what I found. And, um, you know, it really does seem like it's possible to uh, be able to tell the temperature. Um, and so who knows if he, if he saw that and then, um, use that or if he came up with the same conclusion independently, we'll probably never know. Um, just, you know, uh, tonight, you know, the temperature has dropped some, it feels like it's in the 70s maybe. The other day during our field trip, the temperature was in the 90s. When it's very, very warm, uh, you'll notice this without even doing any math, you'll notice that uh, whether it's a field cricket, a snowy tree cricket, um, even a, a true Katie did, uh, any of our orthopteran friends, uh, when they are making sounds, the rate is going to be faster when it's warmer out and it's going to be slower when it's cooler out. Um, I think when I was, I was at Potawatomi in December, remember how we had some warm weather in December? I want to say it was maybe in the 50s. I actually made a recording of some little, it wasn't a field cricket. I don't know uh, what kind of little orthopteran it was, but in December, he was still hanging out in the native plant garden, making these creaky little sounds very, very slowly, just hoping against hope that maybe there was still a, a, a lady cricket out there for him. But um, yeah, faster chirps, warmer weather, um, and in cooler weather, we have slower chirps. And um, if you use those formulas, you can um, approximate the temperature. Some of them are actually pretty darn accurate. So um, another thing that we're seeing a lot of these days are uh, the galls that are forming. Um, and oak trees uh, are just home to so many different types of galls. Uh, a lot of them are created by these little gall wasps that are wee teeny tiny things. Um, I'm not even going to try to identify them because you usually don't see them. What you see are the structures that uh, follow when the female lays the eggs. Um, they're as small as a, a single millimeter um, up to maybe eight millimeters. There's over 800 different kinds just in North America, something like 1300 species worldwide. Um, very tiny. Um, looking at the individual insects. And by the way, this is a really understudied and um, there's not a lot that's understood about how gall wasps function, um, but boy, they make some cool looking structures. This is uh, from Miss Bonnie, you sent in 
uh, think Bonnie had texted me these photos. And um, when I looked at the first one, I didn't have uh, my good glasses on. And, and I honestly thought it was a, a roasted marshmallow. Um, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's an early form of the oak apple gall, which is a, a common and fairly large gall we have in this area. But no, this is actually the wood sower gall. Um, and the, um, the, you know, the female lays eggs, which then uh, cause this, this tissue to form. And inside there, the, gall, the wasp larvae are developing. It's believed that this particular type of gall wasp has a two-year life cycle and one year it's spent in this fluffy woolly, and, and look at this three inches long uh, structure. Um, and then the, it has a, uh, another form that it takes uh, and it creates a gall on the twigs of an oak tree. Um, so it, it takes two years to run it through its complete life cycle. Um, just a really cool looking thing though, isn't it? And you'd think that that little wasp larvae would just be uh, all safe and sound in there. Well, there's always more to the story. And yes, there are uh, uh, wasps that will uh, parasitize the wasps that are parasitizing the trees. So you know, layer upon layer upon layer of connections with these uh, little creatures. Um, after Bonnie sent uh, this photo, I came upon this. Uh, this is an oak apple gall. These are, are pretty common um, around here. This is kind of a small one. That's my palm on the right side there. Uh, this was maybe as big around as a quarter, not even so uh, half dollar size. They can get quite a bit larger than that. And again, same, same idea. Uh, this was created by a wasp and inside there is a developing wasp larvae. Um, and there's um, the interior of the gall is what the larvae will feed upon. And then um, they will develop uh, and um, exit. And then a lot of times in the fall when the leaves come down, you'll notice the, uh, the empty galls on uh, the leaves that have come down to the ground. So uh, just two of many, many different structures you can find if you look closely on the leaves of our local oak trees. So um, I get a really interesting email the other day and I'm curious to see what you guys think of it. Uh, we, uh, in fact, a few weeks ago, we talked about the common grackle and how it is um, actually becoming somewhat uncommon in some areas. It's had a fairly precipitous drop in numbers over the last uh, 50 to 60 years. Um, this is one of the birds that uh, can be um, killed because of its um, uh, impact on crops. So sometimes large numbers are taken out as a pest removal type of action. But anyway, we're not going to talk so much about the, the common grackle uh, we're actually going to talk about the killer grackle. Check this email out. There we were, enjoying the holiday weekend on our patio. Then there was the horrible screech of death, followed by a poof of feathers in the air. Upon investigating, I discovered the purple giant pecking to death and eating a smaller bird. Having witnessed this twice now, it's not pleasant to see, but I guess it is no worse than the hawks that occasion our yard. Yes, we have bird feeders, so you know it is bound to attract all types. It seems that we ourselves are no better as we were cooking chicken on the grill at the time. <laughs> have a nice day, <laughs> Carol. So um, I did a little bit of corresponding with Carol and she said that she's actually um, seen grackles take birds from the air. And I was so surprised to hear that. I, I know they're nest raiders. I, I, well, as we talked about a few weeks ago, there's a lot of birds that raid other birds' nests. Um, but I wasn't aware that the grackle had the, well, the, one, the strength and the, um, the vision and the, um, you know, it, but she, she said that she's actually seen on two different occasions, a grackle take a bird on the wing, um, bring it down, and then uh, feed on it on the ground. Um, I just thought that was 
um, pretty amazing. And if you've seen that, um, let me know in the comments because it was a behavior that um, I just you know wasn't that uh, familiar with. So um, maybe we can we can chat more about that at the end. Uh, now um, let's get away from. Uh, killer birds for a little bit. Let's let's uh, bring it up to uh, something that I look forward to every year. And um, I've realized that different types uh, of basswood do this at, at different times. We've, we've missed it on some of our basswoods. Um, this is a local a little leaf linden tree, but I was walking um, home from work the other day and I was just stopped in my tracks by this really wonderfully sweet perfume in the air. And I realized that I was standing next to this linden tree. I wish, um, I wish I could smell with you, but I'll, I'll share the, the video. You can hear the, the wren was singing in the background. Um, it was just such a heavenly perfume. Um, these trees um, have these tiny little flowers that um, put off this, uh, this scent. Um, beekeepers will sometimes, uh, if, you know, if it's possible to situate their, their honeybee hives near linden trees, they'll do that because of the, the sweet character that these flowers add to the honey. Uh, in fact, sometimes you'll see, you know, basswood honey for sale uh, because they've been able to uh, collect pretty exclusively from these flowers. But um, here's the, the, uh, the flower and the, this winged structure here. Uh, these flowers, once they're fertilized, they're going to turn into uh, tiny little balls. Um, I know this was the tree that uh, we had one growing in uh, the backyard uh, when I was a kid. And this was the tree that made my dad finally give up on trying to clean the gutters himself. And he, he got gutter guards because these, these little balls are maybe, I don't know, maybe a, a quarter, between a, a quarter and maybe a third of an inch in diameter. And, and it's just really, really um, tough to keep your gutters clean when you've got a uh, linden tree or a basswood tree in your yard. Um, now, the uh, a lot of what's planted on our um, parkways in town are the, the linden trees, which are um, not a native species. Our native species would be uh, the basswood. But they both have uh, the leaf. Um, it's smaller in the linden trees. It's bigger in the basswood trees. But it's got this characteristic kind of um, lopsided heart shape to it. Um, so if you're out, I, I really notice the the aroma of uh, the lindens and the basswoods in the evenings. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it's because uh, our uh, humidity. Generally speaking, in the, the evening, the uh, the breeze drops down. Um, and the humidity goes up a little bit, which makes sense uh, carry more easily. But um, if you happen to be out walking around uh, at dusk and afterwards and you notice a really sweet smell, see if you can follow your nose and find that uh, local linden or basswood that's giving off that uh, wonderful aroma. So um, with that, um, we're gonna wind it up for tonight. Um, like I said before, we're, we're not done with crayfish yet. We're going to uh, explore the, the habits of a um, somewhat new invader to this area, the rusty crayfish. But then we're also going to look at what our native crayfish species look like um, in different places you can try and find them. Um, I know there's gonna be lots more. In fact, I've got some, some really intriguing videos that um, came in kind of a big uh, Dropbox dump that I, I haven't been able to sort through yet, but looks like we've got some interesting bird behaviors uh, and things like that that we'll be looking at next week as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna stop the screen share and I've got, looks like we've got a couple of chats here. Uh, do crayfish keep growing until they die? That's a good question, Jerry. I, I think they might. Um, I, I can't say for sure, um, but I know I've seen in captivity adult uh, reproducing crayfish that have uh, continued to molt. So I kind of wonder if maybe they've got uh, um, an infinite, like you know, snakes continue to grow throughout their lives. Um, 
I will double check on that though, because um, I know, you know, like with insects, they get to a certain size and they stop and um, insects and crayfish are both arthropods. So, so I'll double check on that, but I know in, in having kept crayfish, even though they were adults, I've witnessed them molting for, you know, I had one I had for over three years and it continued to molt as it grew. So I'll double check on that, but I kind of think that yes, they do. Um, and the, the newly hatched crayfish stay and they stay for a couple of weeks on mom before they, and during that time they molt a, a couple of times um, and, then, and then they let go. So two weeks is about uh, average. Um, and then Jerry said, she's, she's still got four caterpillars and that really big jumping spider <laughs> on your parsley. So, so parsley and dill, so wait, so that means you've got eight then, right? Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely that season. Um, I have not yet uh, stopped by a, a really big stand of Queen Anne's lace, but that's one of my favorite things to do is to try and see how many uh, little um, black swallowtail caterpillars I can find. Um, and there might be more. Yeah, keep us posted on that. Um, Tricia has sent a photo. Um, I don't know if I can make that work. Oh, Tricia sent a bold jumping spider photo. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, I don't think I did a screen share. Let's see, how would I do that? Uh, here. So this is the photo that uh, Tricia just sent. Yeah, this is another great shot of a bold jumping spider. Doesn't look quite as teddy bear-like from this angle. Um, there's the large, um, the large eyes in the front, and then two more here, and then I think they've got, um, they've got four more tucked around in here somewhere, um, so that they can be fully aware of their surroundings and what's moving around them. That's a great picture. Uh, Stop it. Um, do we still have plants for sale? Hickory knolls, as far as I know, yes, but it's it's um, a good idea to call. Uh, I know that there was a big planting uh, on Saturday out. Um, our restoration crew had uh, herbicided a pretty large patch of grass in what we call Bobolink Field, which is the field west of the boys home that you can see from Route 38. Um, they had a, a, a big effort to get some of those plants in the ground out there. So I would recommend calling first um, 630. I was just there before um, they closed today. Uh -huh. And I got <clears throat> about five or six plants and there were probably 30 or some left. And she, I asked if there were more somewhere else and she said no. Okay. So if you're going to go, I'd go straight away in the morning. What, what did you get, Susie? Did you see what they still had left? I got a couple different milkweeds and I got an, an obedient plant and uh, something else. Anyway, um, I don't know. I'm not good at these plants, but uh, <laughs> there, were, there were quite a few species of milkweed and there was some Coreopsis, I think. Um, and a lot of the obedient plant and the, um, oh gosh, it's the uh, wild, wild quinine. Oh, nice. Okay. There, there was some of that one. also. All right. Um, and I guess that was, that was all that I remember. They okay. were all marked though. Um, the problem is you had to really bend down and I can't do that very well. So, gotcha. um, but you know, if you go in the morning, there should still be plenty. Okay. Well, you know, talking about milkweed, have any of you had this problem? Like my milkweed um, sort of showed up uh, in my backyard several years ago, didn't do real well there. Um, it's not terribly sunny in the backyard, but then there must've been enough seeds that floated over or they landed from somebody else's yard in my front yard. And they did quite well for several years. But then last year, um, the leaves started to look um, 
kind of yellow and they were much, uh, it was common milkweed. So, you know, that has the nice broad leaf to it, but the, it started putting out um, a lot of littler leaves and they were narrow and they were kind of yellow and they, they just didn't look, the plant didn't look that healthy. Um, it, it had all the milkweed bugs on it, it had milkweed, uh, the bugs, the beetles, um, it, it even had a couple of uh, monarchs, uh, monarch caterpillars on it, but the plant didn't look healthy. Um, and this year I have none, there's absolutely no milkweed where my milkweed was growing, which I'm sure um, the, the mail delivery people are happy because uh, I even got a little card in my mailbox one time that I need to move my, my weeds. <laughs> because she was having trouble getting to the mailbox, but, but I, I didn't know it was possible for milkweed to just go away like that. And if it's something, you know, in the ground, I don't want to, um, you know, encourage, I don't want to plant more and then have it get sick too, if it was caused by disease. Um, and uh, the other thing I noticed that um, I, there were about a half a dozen of the red milkweed beetles and they are they were hanging on I've got some lambs here growing you know the the kind of silvery furry leafed plants um, the the milkweed beetles are they must have overwintered and now they're looking for their milkweed and they can't find it so they're trying to make do with um, I almost feel like I should go find them some milkweed because I don't know if they can survive without it um, Diane, that's good for you. Sounds like you're having a good year. Um, and did the, mil <laughs> the mail carrier poison the milkweed? She might have. She um, she doesn't seem to be a fan of my little native garden um, that pretty much surrounds the mailbox and the pathway to it. But um, that's a good question. I I I don't I I could probably do some research and try to sort it out. It, it, it struck me though, as not so much a deficiency in the soil as either some kind of bacteria or virus or some sort of plant disease, because they just didn't look right. Uh, the, the growth habit was, was off, the color was bad. Um, I don't know, but I'm, yeah, I'm fresh out of milkweed. So maybe I should go to the Hickory Knolls plant sale. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, and Kim says they're fickles, they come and go. So maybe mine lent and lent over to, uh, uh, to Diane's house. <laughs> um, I'll keep an eye out. I, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I did throw some seeds down last year too. Um, I had, someone had given me some um, butterfly weed seeds that I'd put and I did some that I just sprinkled and then I did others that I actually planted um, to overwinter outside, but um Okay, and Joy says that there was um, an insect that was spreading a disease, so it should be pulled out and destroyed. So, um, yeah, if you could look at that's right, Joy. You had you had all kinds of uh, caterpillars that you were raising. So, yeah, if, if if you find something concrete on that, let me know. I don't seem to see any trace of the the plants at all. And if if there's some kind of rootstock underneath that I need to go after, though, I will. That'd be good to know. Uh, and then Jerry wanted to know, do monarchs like all types of milkweed? Yes, um, in fact, there are some exotic um, types of milkweed that um, uh, I had someone send me a picture from the Chicago Botanic Garden. And um, it, was, it was a weird looking kind of milkweed and it turns out it wasn't even a, a, a North American species and it had a, a monarch caterpillar on it. Um, but I did um, read how um, the butterfly weed, there, there's, um, you know, the, in the natural world, there's always um, you know, little battles going on between species and the, the monarch needs the milkweed and the milkweed then has to try and make sure that it doesn't you know, get overtaken by the monarch. So there's all the, that's the, the, there's the chemical defense with the butterfly weed. That's a, one of the hairier milkweeds. And um, there's some, not all, clearly not all, but some um, female monarchs will 
shun the butterfly weed because of all the hairs on it. So, um, but yeah, butterfly weed, uh, world milkweed. Um, in fact, sometimes I remember I learned about world milkweed um, because uh, I saw the uh, monarch caterpillars and I didn't even recognize it as a milkweed. That was uh, back several years, but uh, it could be a giveaway. And uh, Diane, I know you and I were talking about uh, dogbane. I, I know I saw a caterpillar feeding, or it was, it was on a dogbane plant, but then Diane, you said that no, they don't eat dogbane, even though dogbane does have a milky sap. Very I, I just I just looked that up again and it says that monarchs will not eat dog will beans. not feed on it yeah so um so yeah I'll I'll could I'll give you that one <laughs> it up too yay but I I'm wondering well and, and after you know after we talked so Diane and I had talked on Saturday about um because uh, I several times said that uh, monarch caterpillars will feed on dogbane and Diane pulled me aside very discreetly the other day and said no they don't <laughs> and uh, I, I saw it in I saw a monarch caterpillar on dogbane in the Hickory Knolls natural area but you know maybe it was getting ready to pupate you know maybe it had left milkweed and had gone to the dog well, it, it might any, even go to just mold yeah because sometimes yeah. they leave the host plant to molt. So. To molt, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and and that they grow milkweed and dog bean are right next to each other on the path right behind the. Bush. Well, I, I'm I'm curious now, and I'm going to do some more research on it. But my, but my understanding is that the monarchs will not eat dog bean. <laughs> yeah, and I I looked up a little bit today, and I couldn't find. Um, uh, there was one reference to a spreading dog bean, but then we started. It was you know the the war of the Latin words and. I needed to get my Dick Young book out in order to sort through um, the uh, website I was looking at was from upstate New York and they were talking about a spreading dog bane there. And I thought, oh, I'm not gonna have time to research this today, but um, <laughs> okay. yeah. It's, um, Jerry, to answer your question, there's a lot of milk milkweeds that they do feed on. Um, but I think there's like 70 different kinds of milkweed, yeah. over 70 different kinds of milkweed. Yeah. and. Um, um, yeah, I know that there's some of these exotic kinds that, that aren't the best for them. It's always good to, to stick with what's, um, you know, native to the area. Uh, that's what yeah, I, I've been doing this a long time and I, the common milkweed to me has always been the best <laughs> for the larva. <laughs> yeah, and that's, well, and that's, that's what landed in my yard and that's what I had until it got fickle. <laughs> right. And, and, and not only that, well, that's. The other thing is that uh, common milkweed is so much easier to see the eggs and to see the larva on. Some of the other fancier um, uh, milkweed with narrower leaves, it's more difficult to see the larva. So th those plants might be very successful, but I just don't observe that. They, they could be. Well, and, and so Jerry commented that her neighbor is convinced that monarchs don't like her milkweed because she's never seen caterpillars. This milkweed that was in my yard, uh, um, I would say it was growing for two or three years um, before I decided to try and raise, to really, really pay attention to it because there's so many things besides monarch caterpillars on milkweed that feed on the little caterpillars. Um, there's um, earwigs, there's ants, there's there's all these different kinds of predators that are lurking out there too. Even the caterpillars, a larger caterpillar, if it's munching away on the milk leaf and it comes across the smaller caterpillar, they'll eat it. We, we had that happen um, multiple times over in the caterpillar raising jars over at Potawatomi. So uh, tell your neighbor, Jerry, that, that they're probably there, but um, they're getting eaten um, the, the, in the egg stage or in the very small caterpillar stage because um, that, that might make her more sad than she already is though. <laughs> <laughs> well just show her your poor your poor little black swallowtail caterpillar and the giant spider. On oh top. I was a little traumatized. <laughs> in the circle of life. <laughs> she, she needs to look for eggs rather than larvae. It's a lot yeah. easier to find eggs than larvae. They're and, right on the corner of the plant, so I'll be able to, I'll, I'll check them too. 
Yeah, check them and, and then, yeah, and that's, I did try, I, I, this was probably three years ago, I raised a few, I, I was so, um, I don't know, anxious all the while, I, I, I would count them sort of uh, neurotically every morning and every night and invariably I'd come up one short and I'd be looking underneath all the leaves and trying to figure out where did the one go and um, it, it was it wasn't the it wasn't the hobby for me <laughs> I did it the one time just to see um, and those were all eggs uh, that I took from the leaves um, in my yard at, you know after observing three years of not really seeing any big caterpillars but they're, they're probably there. They're probably just, you know, something's happening to them. Um, I, um, I named one of my caterpillars, Mr. Chubbs, because he was bigger than the others. And I saw him <laughs> yesterday and he's gone today. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> maybe Mr. Chubbs is, maybe he's putting his, doing his chrysalis now. I hope so. I hope that's it. Let's go with that. Yeah. We've had enough, you know, of the <laughs> side of life. Trauma. <laughs> Go, Mr. Chubbs. <laughs> well, and so Kim made a good comment too that the tropical milkweeds, um, they might somehow affect the development. They might not, um, you know, develop properly. They might not be able to migrate. So that's what I've heard too, Kim, is that the North American, um, the native species are what, what should be planted in order, even though they might feed on some of the tropical ones, it's, it's not something that would be expected for them in this particular area. So stick to what, what's supposed to be here. Um, and then uh, Joy had said that um, she never used to see them on her milkweed until she really started to look. Um, and even if she finds an egg one day, it might be just it might be gone the next day. Yeah, I and that's what got me um, paying more attention too, because I would see monarchs in the neighborhood, and I would see them light on the flower, um, you know, in nectar. Uh, and then when I'd see one, you know, stop on a leaf, I'd figure, oh, there's an egg there. Um, but then I would look if I didn't look right away. Uh, yeah, they they do disappear, and I think it's the the ants and the earwigs and all these other things that are are crawling around on the leaves that are taking care of it. So it's not there's again lots of connections and lots of layers to the story. So um, with that, does anybody else have any uh, questions, comments, concerns? Um, if not. Um, Hope to see you again uh, next week. Um, I am going to try see if I can get the headset worked out so I don't have to be in the uh, now 84 degree room that I'm in right now. If I could <laughs> sit on the porch, uh, that'd be delightful. But uh, again, I, there's so many motorcycles and trucks that have gone by out there. I don't want to try it until we get the sound worked out. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you have a pleasant rest of your evening and um, hope to see you back next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank so, you, Pam. Bye, Pam. Great night. Bye. Thank Great you. Very nice. Yep. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks Pam. Pam. Thanks. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.